Deviance and blasphemy. All that we have mentioned is the conviction of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah without any difference, except in some detailed offshoots, some of which were alluded to, like we said about the case of Taqween. So take note of some weak sayings for which there is no shame in abandoning. They include saying that God's action is created. That's the case of Taqween. So the case of Taqween is going to be that you have two methods for Ahlul Sunnah here. To say that God's act is created or to say that God's act is eternal. Strong saying, according to our Sheikh and others like Abu Hanifa and Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and is attributed also to Ibn Abbas is that God's act is eternal and not created. So God, the actor, is eternal, the eternal actor, and the actor has an eternal act, mm -hmm. and the done thing is created. That's strong saying. Another saying is, God has the power to act. The power to act. So that would mean then the act is created. So they, they're saying God has the power to act, so the act is created and the done thing is created. Mm -hmm. and the actor is not created. The weak saying, according to our Sheikh and others, is that God's action is created. And so you could abandon that. But if you took it, you're not a kafir and you're not a deviant. Mm -hmm. Or that the prophet did not see his Lord on the night of, on the night of Mi'raj. That's a weak saying. Or that he saw him with his eyes instead of his heart. That's not even from the Sahaba, from someone later, not from the Sahaba. That's considered a weak saying. That's so weak. That he didn't see Allah. That's from some of the Sahaba. Mm -hmm. Aisha said he did not see his Lord on that night. Mm -hmm. And some other Sahaba also. Mm -hmm. Or that he saw him with his eyes instead of his heart. That's a weak saying, and that's not even from the Sahaba. To say, yes, he did see him. He saw him with his eyes. That's a weak saying. To say, no, he didn't see him at all. That's a weak saying. No. And it's possible that what they meant was that he didn't see him with his eyes. Mm -hmm. What they said was he didn't see him. It's possible that they meant he didn't see him with his eyes. He saw him with his heart. Mm -hmm. But if we take their statement at face value, they, they're saying he didn't see him. So that's a saying. It's a weak saying. Mm -hmm. Strong saying is that he saw his Lord with his heart or that some women and genies received the revelation of prophethood. That's a weak saying. Some said Maryam and uh, mm -hmm. others were prophets, or prophetesses. Uh, and some said there were genies who were prophets for ayahs that they derived that from. And this is weak saying, both of those. Mm -hmm. Or that any sin mentioned in the Quran about a prophet is not a literal sin. It's called, according to them, it's called them, we're going to call it with our tongues, them and ma'asiyah. And khati'ah, and all of that doesn't mean really. It means something that doesn't befit the status of a prophet. That's weak saying. Or the unrestricted statement that created attributes do not last for two moments. The unrestricted statement, which means to say, created attributes don't last for two moments, period. That unrestricted statement, that's weak saying, because it's really it's not true. It's not accurate. Rather, some attributes of creations last for two moments or more, and some do not. We covered that. Or that had God punished the obedient, it would be foolishness. That's a weak saying. As if who said that didn't know the hadith 
Uh, Indeed, had Allah tortured the people of his earth and the people of his skies, then he would have tortured them without wronging them. Yeah, what they're saying is, if Allah commanded someone to do something, and then that one obeyed Allah as per the command, then doesn't make sense to punish him after that for obeying. That's what they're saying. So how does it make sense? Allah commanded him and then he obeyed. How does it make sense that Allah would punish him? Doesn't make sense. If Allah commanded someone and then he obeyed, then Allah would not punish him for obeying him. So, so they, some of them have a statement that safah, this is foolishness. Others, they said, the notion itself is possible. It's not foolish. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Not by the mind, it's not impossible. There is an impossibility in it, but not by the mind and not because of foolishness. The impossibility lies in the fact that Allah promised and he's not a liar. From this perspective, he will not punish the obedient. Mm. And that it is permitted to derive names for Allah. That's a weak saying. Al-Ghazali said that. He said it's permissible to uh, derive, conjure if you want, names for Allah under guidelines that he mentioned. Not absolutely. So that's a weak saying of his. Mm -hmm. The strong saying is, the names and attributes of Allah are tawqifiyah, halted. That means they are limited to what came in the revelation. Whatever Allah attributed to himself or his messenger, and whatever Allah named himself or his messenger named him or attributed to him, then we say so. And whatever Allah or his messenger did not name Allah or attribute to Allah, then we refrain from such a name or attribute. And that's why we don't say Allah is mustaqir. We say Allah is qadir. Although mustaqir means qadir. Hmm. Mustaqir means qadir, powerful, able. As for the fundamentals, there is no difference in them between the Ash'ariya and the Maturidiya. Fundamentals means not the branches, except in semantics, just the words. That's the only thing that's different between them. Like whether or not faith increases or decreases, their creed in this case is the same. When one gets to, gets to the bottom of that issue, does faith increase or decrease? One party said faith increases and decreases. One party said faith does not increase or decrease. And their statements at face value are contradictory. Either it does or it doesn't. But when you investigate the meaning of these and investigate the meaning of these, you'll find they're saying the same thing. So then it's a case of semantics. It's just how they're defining things. Or the case of feeling secure from God's punishment or feeling hopeless from his mercy or hopeless of his mercy. One party said, feeling secure from God's punishment is blasphemy. Feeling hopeless of his mercy is blasphemy. One party said, not blasphemy. But if you investigate the meanings of what they are saying, then you'll see they really believe the same thing. And the difference is just how they're defining words. And that's why one said blasphemy and one party said not blasphemy. But in belief, Yani, what exactly the one party is saying is blasphemy. The other party, they say it's blasphemy. They're just not using the same words. And what in meaning the other party is saying is not blasphemy. The other party says also it's not blasphemy. But they're not saying the same words for those. So it's just the semantics. It's the words they're using, yani, that's different, not the meaning. This would, this would be more clear in Arabic. Than in For me, it's the same. Really? Yeah, because they're using the same words. Mm -hmm. So they say in Arabic, one party says, Al-amnu min makrillahi kufr. 
One party says, Al-amnu min makrillahi laysa kufran. One party said, Feeling secure from God's punishment is blasphemy. One party said, Feeling secure from God's punishment is not blasphemy. So it's the same thing. Their words are uh, contrary. But the meaning is the same when you investigate. They believe the same thing. So what that boils down to is that one party is saying, despairing or feeling secure from God's punishment means, and then they're going to define it this way. So the other one's going to say, no, that's not what it means. It means this. So then they're going to say, no, that's not what it means. So they believe the same thing. They're just using different words. Mm -hmm. However, the difference in the case of Tequeen creation is not merely semantics. But there is no charge of blasphemy or heresy. And we covered that. It's not merely semantics. They do really have a difference there. When one party said, the doer is eternal and the doing is eternal and the done is created. And one party said, the doer is eternal, but we mean really he has the power to do something. We don't even mean that really in eternity he's doing. We don't mean he's eternally a doer. We're saying the doer is eternal and we don't even really mean he's a doer in eternity. We mean he has power to do something in eternity. So they have really a difference there, but this difference is very thin. So it doesn't make someone a kafir or a deviant. Mm -hmm. But one side has a stronger argument than the other side. Now, here, the word creation is put in parentheses, T-I-O-N, yes. on purpose there, because I say, when it comes to tr translating this case, if you wanted to try to match what's happening in Arabic to English, then I say this is the best word to use. Creation, T-I-O-N, yes. Because this form of the word can be in the English language, it can be the attribute and it can be the done thing. Mm -hmm. So the Maturidis are saying, at taqwinu azali. And the uh, and the Esha'aris are saying, at taqwinu mahmuk. So that translates to say the, the Maturidis are saying the creation is eternal. And the Esha'aris are saying the creation is not eternal. And when the Maturidi say taqween, they mean an attribute. And when the Ash'ari say taqween, they mean mukawwan. Mukawwan, the done thing. In Arabic, the masdar, the source, is often used to refer to the done thing. It's mm -hmm. often. So you say in Arabic, khal and you mean makhluk, and you say fi'l, and you mean maf'ul, and you say akl, and you mean ma'kul, and you can keep going and going and going there. So he's saying taqween, and it means to him mukawwan. So the word creation in English could mean the attribute of creating God's creation, his act of creating. So then creation could mean creating. And the English word creation could mean created. So the Maturidis are saying creation is eternal as an attribute of Allah. And they mean the creating. The Ash'aris are saying creation is not eternal because it's the created. The one. So there is truly a difference here between the two madhabs, but there is no charge of blasphemy or heresy. Rather, here there's a case of tarjih, preponderance. One of those is weightier than the other. Nor is there a difference between those who preceded them, like Ash-Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy upon them, and all of the inference madhabs and hadith madhabs. We talked about that. And everyone who practiced this religion, having the conviction of the saved sect, as we have described, 
is upon the truth and the straight path. Therefore, whoever deems him a heretic is himself a heretic. And whoever deems him misguided is himself misguided. And whoever deems him a blasphemer without some misapplication that saves him from blasphemy is himself a blasphemer. In the original text, the author said, and whoever deems him a, a blasphemer is a blasphemer. So the detail was added here for more precision because it's not absolute like that. This is because whoever believes that faith is blasphemy and that guidance is misguidance and that orthodoxy is heresy, then his creed is blasphemy, misguidance, and heresy. Because the implication of one's opinion is his opinion when that implication is obvious. I think we spoke about that. So that statement there, that's the strong statement. There are three statements. That's one statement. The implication of your opinion is your opinion. The other statement is, The implication of your opinion is not your opinion. And the third statement is, The implication of your opinion is your opinion when it's obvious. When the implication is obvious. Or, if you want, the insinuation. The insinuation of your, opin of your opinion is your opinion when that insinuation is obvious. And I think we mentioned that examples also. First, Iani, let's look at the statements here. The first two statements are not the strong statements because each one of them requires a qualifier. So those who said, the implication of your opinion is not your opinion, they were saying, just because someone said something doesn't mean he believes in its insinuation. That's not necessary always because he said something that he adheres to its insinuations and implications. That's not absolute rule. That's correct. Uh, but someone will take that statement and run with it. Yeah. And same thing for the other one. The implication of your opinion is your opinion. So that statement alone like that, it's not the best statement because it doesn't exclude something that needs to be excluded. Mm -hmm. So then the best statement is this one. The implication of your opinion is your opinion when that implication is obvious. So examples are like the implication uh, when someone says, if someone were to say, Allah sits on the throne uh, so what does that imply or insinuate that he's a body? And he doesn't say Allah is a body. He doesn't utter those words. No. So then if we accuse him of believing that Allah is a body, he might say, I never said that. That's how anyone's going to argue with you in any case. And say, I didn't say that. So then in so many cases, you're going to have to say, that's true. You didn't say it. But you implied it. You heavily implied it. Your insinuation is so obvious that it's like you said it. And in fact, I'm going to count that insinuation as your position. Do you deny it? Deny it then. So he might say, I, I, I do deny. I don't say Allah has a body. Oh, then don't say Allah sits then. You don't know what sits means? Uh, or someone says, Allah cannot be seen. Okay, he says that. What does that imply? It implies that Allah does not exist. So here, if we uh, impose on him that he will say, no, I'm not saying Allah doesn't exist. So can we here? Can we impose that on him? Some scholars said, yes, we can. They said, Lazim al Madhabi Madhab. The implication of your opinion is your opinion. You believe that, then you believe everything that it leads to. 
Others said, eh, it's not that straight. So they didn't, they said, okay, uh, we'll give you some room there that you don't believe that Allah doesn't exist. But you're saying he does though. You are implying he does though. Stop saying that. Mm -hmm. Don't say Allah can't be seen because this is what you're insinuating. Then if he doesn't agree, then we'll have to argue with him there. How does his denying that Allah can be seen lead to denying his existence? What's the difference between these two examples? In the case of the one who said Allah sits without saying he's a body, the insinuation is obvious. In the case of the one uh, saying that Allah can't be seen without denying his existence, here the implication is not obvious. So since that insinuation is not obvious, then it wasn't far-fetched for us to be able to not impose it on him as far as judging him. Now we're just going to an annihilate his argument, though. Yeah. We're, we're not going to charge him as a kafir for that uh, ambiguous or obscure insinuation but we are going to devastate his argument. We're not going to let up off his argument and say, okay, but this is what you're saying. And it leads to this. How? Because of this. But I disagree. Well, there's this. Eh, no, you're never going to get out of this argument. So, hack of that. The implication of one's opinion is his opinion when that implication is obvious. So, those scholars who said, Lazimul Madhabi Madhab, they said, everyone who has a belief that's wrong belief is a kafir. That's how some Ahlul Sunnah said. They said they're all kuffar. Even the Shiites who said that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman shouldn't have been the first caliphs. They said Ali should have been the first caliph. Well, then that's implying that something. If you follow that through, that's going to insinuate the companions. And then that's going to lead to something else. Eventually, it's going to lead to contradicting the religion. So they said, kufr. Then they have to deal with the fact that they are uh, imposing on people things that they don't really, really believe. So that's why we're not taking that position. Because then that will demand that we're going to literally impose on people things that they don't believe. That one who denies that Allah can be seen, he doesn't believe that Allah doesn't exist. So are we gonna argue, why are we going to argue with him that he believes that? We're not going to argue with him that he believes that. Mm -hmm. We're going to argue with him that what he says leads to that. And because the Prophet wasallam said, anyone who says to his fellow Muslim, oh, blasphemer, then one of those two goes back as a blasphemer. However, heresy... Bid'ah, innovation, which is innovation in the creed, is of two types. Uh, yani, when they say bid'ah in aqidah, bid'ah means heresy. It's frequently going to be translated as innovation, though. But if you wanted a religious word that's like standard in English language, it would be a heresy. Heresy, which is innovation in the creed, is of two types. One that demands deeming the heretical innovator as a disbeliever, and one that does not. Anyone having a heresy that demands deeming him a disbeliever is not described as having faith. So some examples of bid'ah that's not kufr is like believing that paradise and hell don't exist yet, but that they will exist and be everlasting. Whoever denies that paradise or hell is everlasting, he's a kafir. Whoever denies that they are now presently existing, he's an innovator. Also, if someone uh, denies the, the validity of the rulership of Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman, this is bid'ah that's not kufr by itself. Also, if someone believes that Allah cannot be seen, that that's impossible, this is a bid'ah that's not kufr. 
and some scholars, those who said, Lazim al Madhabi Madhab, the implication of your opinion is your opinion, they said all of that's kufr. Because it all it really does lead to kufr, actually. It's basically the excuse that we're giving them, those who don't give it to them. Yani, they're not wrong. Those who deem all of that kufr, they're not wrong in saying that all that stuff leads to kufr. They're saying, so whatever leads to kufr is kufr. So some scholars, they said, no, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. So know that blasphemy is categorized in several ways. According to one way, there are two types, paganism and non-paganism. The first, paganism, is like idol worship, that is paganism, idolatry or heathenism, or fire worship. Now, we're really using the word paganism in a very broad sense, because traditionally paganism, paganism is idol worship. We're lumping a lot of things under paganism more than just idol worship. Like idol worship or fire worship or corporeality of God, that's tejseem, bodifying God. Or that he dwells in bodies, as some of them coin God bodies, those people who believe that they are God like five percenters, they call themselves God bodies. Those are these ones, Hululia. Or pantheism, believing that God and the world are one and the same. Or Trinity, which is believing that there is one eternal God who has three personalities. Or believing that man creates his own deeds, that's denial of destiny. That's the same as saying, I make my own destiny. Or that there are two gods, a light who creates good and a darkness who creates evil. That's very specific because that's a creed of some blasphemous people. That's the creed of the Majus. Examples of the second non-paganism are like insulting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or belittling the religion, which is sacrilege, or contradicting what is commonly known to be of the religion. That means deeming the unlawful as lawful or deeming the lawful as unlawful or deeming the obligation as not obligatory, etc. Or deeming what is religiously legitimate as illegitimate. When we say that, deeming what is religiously legitimate as illegitimate, that now covers what they have disagreement about, sometimes to a certain degree, like uh, circumcision. So the Maliki said circumcision is sunnah, and the Shafi'i said circumcision is wajib, obligatory. Maliki said recommended. Shafi'i said obligatory. So they differed. Is there some agreement in any way here? Yes. It's all legitimate. It's legitimate. Mm -hmm. The legitimacy of circumcision covers whether it's recommended or obligatory. Whoever denies the legitimacy of circumcision, then he's a kafir. And the word I'm translating for legitimate is mashru'ah. Meshru'ah, from the word shara. The shara is the religious law. Meshru'ah is what was made religious law or something like that. According to another classification, there is comparing God to the creations, contradicting the religion, and dismantling monotheism, which is atheism. That's just an attempt to translate the words literally, which we're not committing to that in this book to translate here literally. But maybe for a benefit to make a person get a sense of the words that are being used in Arabic. Tashbih, takdeeb, and ta'atil. 
They use ta'atil to mean atheism. Ta'atil is like dismantling something or rendering it like nullifying something. The first, comparing God to the creations, is paganism. The second is like denying the obligation of the prayers or the prohibition of wine, which we just talked about that. So we're just looking at how is blasphemy classified in different ways. The third is like denying that Allah exists or denying that he has power over the deeds of the slaves or that he has power over evil or that he knows the details of everything or that he is attributed with uncreated speech. All of those are masail. Those are all cases. Denying that Allah exists, that's atheism. That's blatant atheism. Denying that he has power over the deeds of the slaves, that's an implied atheism. But more directly, that's denial of destiny. Denial of destiny is atheism in a way. It's also shirk, also. We'll see. Uh, or that he has power over evil. That's close to the last one. Doesn't create the deeds of the slaves. But those who said he doesn't create the deeds of the slaves, they said any voluntary deed, he doesn't create it. He only created our bodies, according to them. And created for us, yeah, he gave us, according to them, the power to create our own voluntary actions. Uh, those are the same, or there's some like them. Yani, they're all more Tazila, so they might have merged those or separated those, but all under the more Tazila. Those who said he doesn't create the evil. Those are refuted by it being said to them, who created the devil? Or that he knows the details of everything. That's from the philosophers. They said he just knows things in general, not in detail. We already saw the ayah a few sessions ago that proves that he knows everything in general and in detail. Or that he's attributed with uncreated speech. That's the also Mu'tazila. A third classification agreed upon in the four schools also divides blasphemy into three types, cardiac, enacted, and verbalized. Cardiac means pertaining to the heart. Enacted means performed. And verbalized means said. The first is for the heart to compare God. So what these three are the sites of the blasphemy, the location where it's coming from. The first is for the heart to compare God or deny him. So there you have tashbih and ta'atil. Or for the heart to deny prophethood. Or permit a religion other than Islam. Or to contradict Islam. For the heart to contradict Islam. Or to disrespect it or to doubt about it. All of that's kufr from the heart. So, like then, Yani, this is all kufr from the heart. What did we find here? We found here uh, doubts, denials, um, disrespect, all of these from the heart. The second is like prostrating to a creation, no matter the intention, except a human. Prostrating to a human for mere salute is forbidden in the law of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or throwing away religiously respectable material while realizing what it is. Or sitting or spitting on it. The third is like calling a Muslim a blasphemer without any excuse or confusion. Or verbally disrespecting God or disrespecting his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or his religion. 
Sacrilege, which is disrespect, religious disrespect, is its own category of blasphemy, like insulting God or spitting on a religious paper or sitting on it. Calling to the correct religion. Amongst what is obligatory upon you, besides acquiring this correct belief, is commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Concealing the obligatory knowledge is forbidden, and you have to teach someone who seeks it from you, unless you have an excuse, such as to forward that person to someone more qualified than yourself, and you're excused to do that. You might not even be excused to do that. You might need to take that person and teach him the obligatory knowledge so you don't delay him from something that he needs to learn immediately. Uh, However, act wisely. Indeed, the one who wants to help but makes things worse is a fool. That's Safi. True faith is by examination and verification and checking. Then, when one's life, money, and family are safe, one should display it, that true faith. Call others to it and offer it. Denying the religion is blasphemy. If someone's life was threatened over blasphemy, so he displayed the blasphemy without changing his conviction, he has no sin. Allah Ta'ala says, Except who was compelled to commit blasphemy, while his heart is firm with faith. Um, and then also when you were talking about uh, legit, what is legitimized in mm -hmm. religion, mm -hmm. um, this regards to the things that are talked about within Islam, if a person denies them, being a part of Islam, is that what you were... When we talk about what's legitimate in religion, the examples that I know refer to cases that they differed about them, like their exact judgment. Is it obligatory or is it sunnah, like witr prayer? Another example is witr prayer. The Hanafi said it's wajib, and everyone else said sunnah. So they differed about it. So usually when they differ about a case, then if you deny one of those sides, then you're not going to commit blasphemy because they differed about it. So is there any way to commit blasphemy there then? Yes, when you deny the legitimacy of it altogether. This is how, as I've learned what's denial of what's mashroor. That's what's in Mukhtasar. After he says, like, uh, the lawful and the unlawful, the obligatory or not obligatory, the lawful or the unlawful, and he says, or what's mashru'ah. And then, so that's like circumcision or witr prayer. I mean, okay.